This is our final image review using the theme of pieces for AP World Modern. We're at the last unit of the course and the last of Era 4. Unit 9, Globalization from 1900 to the present. Now when we take a look at the first theme of governance, unlike Unit 7 and Unit 8, there's simply one topic, one objective for this one, and that's institutions developing in a globalized world. Now the goals of the League of Nations following World War I were the disarmament of nations, preventing war through collective security, settling disputes between countries through negotiation, diplomacy, and approving global welfare. It was the U.S.'s idea, but we never joined. And that gives way to one of the main examples, the United Nations, and forming in the aftermath of World War II, it's headquartered in New York, and it has offices in Geneva, Switzerland, Nairobi, Kenya, Vienna, Austria, and The Hague in the Netherlands. It's agreed to have been much more successful than the League of Nations, but results have been admittedly mixed. So, governance, one topic. The theme of technology and innovation gets fairly significant play here. When we look at 9.1, advances in technology and exchange after 1900. The internet. You know, the internet is explicitly mentioned and it's a new mode of communication, as well as transportation. That's where shipping containers come in. They have solved the problem of, or reduced the problem, geographic distance. Shipping containers were first used prior to World War II, but the standardized containers developed in the late 40s and early 50s. And the internet, well, if you're watching this, you have a pretty decent idea of what the internet has done. Energy technologies, including nuclear power, has raised productivity and increased the production of material goods. Nuclear power is a form of energy created using nuclear reactions, and some feel it's safe and sustainable, while others maintain that it poses serious dangers to the environment and those living near them. Fertility rates. All right, there's a number of different things, like the effect of birth control, which has given women greater control over fertility transform reproductive practices, and they've contributed to what you see here. Declining fertility rates. And, you know, this most recently goes up to 2017. Those varying factors have led to this decline. Staying on point with 9.19a, because there's a total of five historical developments here. Pictured is Norman Verloc winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for his efforts to fight global hunger by increasing crop yields, and he initially wanted to create a resilient wheat strain in Mexico following World War II. He's the father of what's called the Green Revolution, and it encompasses new varieties of wheat and rice crops that either doubled or tripled their production. Malnutrition decreased in Mexico, and the results are duplicated in India and Pakistan. So these sustain the Earth's growing population as it spreads chemically and genetically modified agriculture. These new crops need nitrogen. All right, they, they need nitrogen and water, which in some cases are lacking, and in the case of nitrogen could harm the soil. Finally, medical innovations like vaccines, like the administration of the polio vaccine you see here, and antibiotics like penicillin, increase the ability of humans to survive and live longer lives. Penicillin is discovered in 1928 and is used to treat a variety of bacterial infections like staph infections and strep throat. Polio vaccine, first invented by Jonas Salk in 1955, which has an inactivated form of the virus, helped eliminate polio in the Americas by the mid-1990s. So we got governance, we have technology. Next, we move on to humans and the environment. This gets a little bit of play in this unit. So 9.2, advances and limitations in technology with disease. Malaria is a disease associated with poverty, and this shows why. Vast majority of deaths are in sub-Saharan Africa while most of the rest are in South and Southeast Asia. Look at this. 
Europe and North America are not shown since there are zero deaths. They're more affluent countries, hence why malaria is associated with poverty. The 1918 influenza pandemic is a disease that emerged as new epidemics and threats to human populations, in some cases leading to social disruption. It was nicknamed the Spanish flu because Spain was one of the few European countries not censoring their news during the war. So their increased number of cases led some to believe that Spain was the origin. From February 1918 to April 1920, 500 million people are infected. That's a third of the world. And 20 to 50 million of 20 to 50, excuse me, million are killed. Now some diseases occurred at a higher incidence merely because of increased longevity. That's Alzheimer's disease. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S. and is a progressive disease where initial, mem uh, initial mild memory loss gives way to the inability to carry on a conversation. So all of these are the topic of disease. Appropriately enough, the other topic that deals with the environment is debates about the environment after 1900. Desertification is when land becomes dry and arid and is usually marked by regions losing bodies of water and vegetation. Overgrazing, extension of agricultural lands, desertification, and poor irrigation practices are the main human causes of this, and it's accelerated to 30 to 35 times the normal rate. Human activity has also contributed to a decline in air quality from 1900 to the present as increased numbers of power plants control burns and emissions from motor vehicles have contributed to this uh, decline in air quality. And finally, climate change, greenhouse gases. According to NASA, the average global temperature has risen a little over 2 degrees Fahrenheit since 1880 and the Earth is losing 429 billion metric tons of ice sheets per year, amongst other statistics. The human expansion of the greenhouse effect is a major contributor to these changes, and that's the warming trend where the Earth's atmosphere traps heat instead of releasing it into space. So these are the two main environmental topics. Next theme, cultural developments and interactions. When we look at cultural developments, the lone topic is 9.6, and that's globalized culture after 1900. We're looking at pop culture, essentially. In terms of TV, the BBC, or the British Broadcasting Corporation, made its first broadcast in 1930 and is the oldest national broadcaster in the world. Their world service was launched in 1932, which is why you can watch the uh, BBC NewsHour on PBS and listen to it on NPR. Twitter is a social media engine launched in 06, and as of 2019, it has about 330 million active users. You get your point across using characters. It was 140, now it's at 280, and a message is considered a tweet. For global sports, the modern Olympics began in 1896, and they've continued to the present day. Nearly every nation is represented in its two-week events, so that's why it's global. Coca-Cola is a global brand, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. It's first sold in 1886, and its marketing strategies have led to its role as a global soft drink. And eBay is online commerce. Founded in 1995, it's an auction website where people can bid on goods and services worldwide. And it's certainly take commerce and it's taking commerce to a global level, and it's a worldwide brand. The other cultural topic is resistance to globalization. All right, Weibo, Chinese social media platform with 445 million active monthly users. It's launched in 2009, and it's designed for Chinese users because Twitter and Facebook are blocked in the country. There were movements that rose in opposition to institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, and even the World Trade Organization. They were intensified in the late 20th century. Protests like what happened in Seattle against the WTO in 1999 
have essentially led to protests at all meetings of these so-called global institutions. So that covers cultural developments and interaction. Economics, systems. When we look at economic systems, the main topic is economics in the global age. That's topic 9.4. Deng Xiaoping in China exemplifies a government that encouraged free market policies. He allowed economic modernization in China. You know, they engaged in central planning, but they encouraged outside firms to build in China, like in Hong Kong. His visit in 79 that you see here to the U.S. solidifies this attitude. Revolutions in information and communications technology led to the growth of knowledge economies. Finland was agriculturally based in the 1950s, but they have become a knowledge economy because of their reforms of their education system. Knowledge economies are also called post-industrial societies, and they feature a skilled and educated workforce they emphasize the necessity of skills like problem solving and the importance of information technology or the digital economy. Industrial production and manufacturing were increasingly situated in Asia and Latin America. This factory in Bangladesh is a huge example. You know, Bangladesh has some of the lowest labor costs not only in Asia but also the world and garment and textile industries make up most of its largest exports. About 42% of Bangladesh's population, age 25 and older, have no education. So in places like Bangladesh, social unrest continues to be an issue. The World Trade Organization is an economic institution, you know, example of that, or a regional trade agreement, began in 1995 with the goal of regulating and facilitating trade between nations. But the promise of free trade, as we saw in the previous topic, has also been met with scrutiny. And finally, Mahindra and Mahindra is a multinational corporation. It's headquartered in India and it makes automobiles and tractors. It builds these places in South Africa, or I should say South Asia, Africa, the US, China, and Australia. So that's why it's a multinational corporation. And finally, we arrive at social interactions and organization. Topic 9.5, calls for reform and responses after 1900 is the example of this. So much like with 9.1, we've broken it up into two slides. Now, feminism began to pick up steam in the second half of the 20th century, but continues to differ based on race and whether or not it's concentrated in the global north or global south. The Negritude Movement is designed to cultivate what's known as Black Consciousness in the context of the African diaspora, and it often used Marxist philosophy to make their points. The Harlem Renaissance in the United States is a prime example of this. Liberation Theology, and again, these are all challenges to assumptions about race, class, gender, and religion. Liberation Theology is referred to as a social concern for the poor and political liberation for oppressed peoples. And this became the focus of Latin American Catholic theologians following the Vatican II Council. And the man on screen is Peruvian priest Gustavo Gutierrez, who wrote A Theology of Liberation, the defining book of the movement. Women were granted the right to vote in a host of countries in the 20th century, including Brazil which the cartoon implies, and Brazil gave this right in 1932. The end of segregationist apartheid policies in South Africa occurred in the early 90s and resulted in the legalization of the African National Congress and the election of Mandela as president. Greenpeace is an NGO, it's an environmental movement that is headquartered in Amsterdam. Its goal is to ensure the ability of the earth to nurture life in all its diversity. And finally, an economic movement. World Fair Trade Organization protests the inequality of the economic consequences of global integration. They have members from 76 countries and they strive for fair representation of disadvantaged producers worldwide. 
Continuity and change the targeting reasoning process. So take a moment, look at the prompt. 